there's one more. Okay, um, we'll get started. Welcome back, as I was saying, to another semester of Penn's workshop in the history of material text. And we believe that Peter began the workshop in January, 1993, mid-year, although the precise date is lost in the pre-digital age when announcements were circulated on scraps of paper put in colleagues' mailboxes. So we don't actually know the, the first meeting of the workshop. Um, but since we think it was January 93, we are now officially into our 29th year of meeting each Monday evening during the academic year. And we've got a great lineup of talks this semester. If you haven't seen the full list, you can um, see it in the, on our website or in the email that Island sends out. Um, we've got a great lineup beginning with today and next week, both entirely on Zoom. Uh, but then we plan to return to the sixth floor of Van Pelt while continuing to stream on Zoom as we did uh, last semester. And we'll be hearing this spring about everything from Goethe's failures, Korean typewriters, feminist bibliography, writing in library books, and much more. So do sign up if you're not already on it for our listserv. You can sign up via the website, pen, penmaterialtext.org, um, and you'll get our weekly emails with all the details. Um, I'm Zach Lesser, um, uh, one of the organizers of the workshop, along with my colleagues, Jerry Singerman from uh, now Emeritus, Humanities Editor at the Penn Press. Welcome. And John Pollock of and in the Kislak Center tonight. <laughs> um, and our uh, fellow who makes it all work, Eileen Malcolm, who will be presenting in two weeks, three weeks, three weeks. Um, so uh, you'll wanna uh, come back for that, especially those of you who are here specifically because you're medievalists. Um, after the talk, as always, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So just a reminder, use the raise hand function on Zoom. You'll get in the queue and I'll call on you and ask you to unmute. Uh, the chat's also open if you prefer to ask your question there. Uh, I'm very pleased that we're able to begin the semester with a talk from Pamela Smith, though we wish we were convening in person. Um, she is the Seth Lowe Professor of History and Director of the Center for Science and Society at Columbia. Her work focuses on early modern Europe, the scientific revolution, and the relationship of science to craft knowledge. And she's the author of several prize-winning books, including The Business of Alchemy, Science and Culture in the Holy Roman Empire, published by Princeton in 1994, which won the Pfizer Prize, which is not about vaccines, but has been awarded since 1959 by the History of Science uh, Society for the best book of the year. And in 2004, she published The Body of the Artisan, Art and Experience in the Scientific Revolution with Chicago, and it won the Leo Gershoy Award from the American Historical Association for the most outstanding work on 17th and 18th century Western European. Was I muted that whole time? Just for the last sen sentence. Sorry about that. I don't know how that happened. Um, so did you hear about the Leo Gershoy Award? Okay, good. Uh, and she's held uh, fellowships from the Guggenheim, the NEH, the Mellon Foundation, the National Science Foundation, which is an unusual one for our speakers, uh, among others. And most importantly for us, uh, Pamela is the PI of the Making and Knowing Project, which explores the intersection of artisanal making and scientific knowing in the early modern period. The project includes humanists and scientists, artists and artisans, as they explore an anonymous 16th century artisanal and technical manuscript, which we'll learn more about tonight. So please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Pamela Smith. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. Uh, thank you, Jerry. And thank you, um, Aylin, for all of your hard work. Um, and John, as well as an organizer. So I want to start by looking closely, um, not at words of a text, but at images in this painting um, from the early 17th century. If we were here in person, I'd ask you all to call out what you see in this painting, but you can't really do it on Zoom. Um, so I'm just going to go through it and um, talk to you a little bit about it. So there are really a huge number of specific 
objects and practices going on in this painting, in this detail of a painting. Um, this is an allegory of fire. And you can see that there are um, metal workers here hammering out a piece of metal. You can see these armor polishers on a new piece of technology for polishing armor. You can see this um, person in the far background hammering steel rims onto cannon wheels um, for cannon carriages. And here there's this wonderful illustration of a um, trip hammer, water-driven trip hammer for hammering out iron, um, steel armor, sorry, steel armor. And then of course in the foreground you see all kinds of products of this art, of this craft, in particular, all the armor, the glassware, the, um, the goldsmith's workshop tools right here. So this painting is evidence of the interest and enthusiasm in the 16th and 17th centuries for the processes and products of craftspeople. And it's a piece of evidence for that enthusiasm, as well as for an interest in nature, natural materials, and art, that is the work of the human hand in shaping nature and in practical knowledge in early modern Europe. A painting like this at the beginning of the 17th century rested upon the fact that from about 1400, many types of craftspeople had begun to write down their techniques. Before this, most books of practice were almost exclusively written by individuals from the scholarly world, whereas in contrast, around 1400, artisans themselves took up the pen, including painters most well known, but also gunpowder makers, ships pilots, fortification builders, dancing masters, among many others. They all practiced what were called the mechanical arts. They worked with their hands to produce objects and make a livelihood, and their writing signaled a departure from the traditional conception of authorship as part of the liberal arts and appropriate to the university educated. Moreover, these texts were on new subjects, not previously part of a textual or ancient canon of texts, such as mining that you see here. Um, these texts also appeared in manuscript, obviously from about 1400. This is an example by a well-known goldsmith of Nuremberg, Wenzel Jaminitzer, who you'll hear more about in the course of the lecture. It's a wonderful um, uh, display of surveying. And you even have this fellow up here who is um, doing divining. Um, in order to uh, find the ore, to locate the ore. There are many diverse authors of these texts, practitioners um, such as Hieronymus Brunschwig, um, who was a barber surgeon and published on distillation and on um, medical practice and surgery. You have on the right a book on horse doctoring. Many of the um, many of these how-to texts are also the work of entrepreneurial printers. In fact, they often had a lot to do with um, compiling these texts. And here is Johann Schoensberger, the younger, um, who really experimented with his craft, really emphasizing the new capacities and capabilities of his craft. And also, you know, you'll notice um, he uses new, new, um, a new model book, which is um, expanded and improved. Uh, and he, um, these are the, what the contents of those books, they are basically patterns for weaving and embroidery, but you can see the kind of work that went into this, um, into these texts in terms of just the experimentation with new modes of presenting information. By the mid 16th century, a huge number of such books were being printed in many vernacular languages, sometimes translated into Latin. Um, but it's interesting to note in the case of this book, this extreme, this kind of bestseller at the time um, by the pseudonymous Alessio Piemontese, Book of Secrets. Secrets, but there, it's really just a book of recipes or accounts of how to do things. Um, but in all of these different languages in which it was translated, it first appeared in Italian, 
um, it was changed. It had different contents, different contents were compiled, although there was a kind of core set of topics on metal casting, on perfumery, and in this text on medical recipes as well. So these texts obviously sold well for printers. Many editions came out of some of them, including this one, The Secrets. And it's clear that an audience was developing for such texts. Publications such as this one by Jost Amen and Hans Sachs, the Ständebuch or book of, um, it's called the book of trades often in English, but it's really the book of estates, um, it contributed to this celebration and valorization of practical knowledge, as well as to the, the real celebration of the artisans who practiced. Um, and in this text, um, Amon and Sachs portray artisans as diligent, industrious, and importantly, the central pillar of social order. You know, it's not the church, it's not um, the, the emperor, but rather it is the artisans who are the central pillar of social order. Practical knowledge was obviously from these images I've been showing you, not just written down, but also depicted with some authors arguing that processes must be illustrated in order to be comprehensible. And in such images such as these here by Jan van der Straat, the very versatile um, artisan Jan van der Straat, his Nova, very famous um, series of prints, the Nova Reperta, uh, not only provided careful views of all kinds of technologies, but made the point over and over again that these were part of a new age. And this is an argument which probably most of you know is pursued, especially in the frontispiece to the print series. You can see the young, the, the circle of time here, the Ouroboros and the young um, individual entering from the left and pointing to the new world, the so-called new world, and time leaving, old time leaving the stage over here. You can see all of the so-called inventions or discoveries, recoveries of the, this new age, um, cannons, gunpowder, uh, mechanical clocks, silkworms, um, distillation, uh, Brazil wood, log wood for um, pigments, and the compass. But, uh, and you can see here that um, emphasis again um, on the new age where he, he's showing the polishing of armor, which we saw in the um, image after Jan um, Bruegel. And again, looking at this new um, technique of polishing armor mechanically. Um, and the caption here is the polishing of armor. And I'm afraid that you can't see the um, little caption beneath it, which says, um, in our time, not in antiquity. So again, making that point that this is a new age. So the dissemination in books and prints by artists and artisans about their processes of craft, their know-how, and their ability to create and invent novel things appropriate to a new age would, in the course of the following centuries, uh, help to foster a new sense that this knowledge of how to make and do things would give rise to ever-increasing production and material progress something that's very familiar to us today, but of course um, was something new at the time. Such perspectives contributed to a new view about uh, human capability and especially about the human relationship to nature that became very important in informing the people who began to call themselves the new scientists in the course of the 17th century. So in this talk, I'm not going to discuss further these claims made by artisans in their texts or about the relationship of their work to the new science, but rather I'm going to talk about what kind of knowledge is contained in such texts. Practical knowledge is hard to study, and until recently, many of these practical texts have been neglected. They're technically complex, they're often fragmentary, they don't offer a linear narrative nor explicitly, in most cases, explicitly articulated theories. Um, they really, in some ways, deflect traditional scholarly analysis. 
Um, but I'll argue today that the interpretation of the contents of these texts really calls out, call out for new methods of research um, and especially hands-on reconstruction and digital um, presentation and analysis. So with that, I'm going to um, uh, talk a little bit about the Making and Knowing Project, which I founded in 2014 to, as Zach said, study the, um, the relationship between um, artisanal on craft making and scientific knowing, and um, to really try to understand more about the content of these how-to texts and the practical knowledge of craft. Um, and what we really found in the project is that the, um, you know, people often think of these how-to texts as really just about techniques for how to make and do things, that is the making part of the project's title. But through our research, I think we gained real insights into how this practical knowledge was also conceptual, um, and that connects to the scientific knowing part of the project's title. So since 2014, the project has focused on researching how-to knowledge in this text in what's really a remarkable late 16th century text, anonymous text of practice. And last year we published, or I guess in 2020, not last year anymore, um, we published a digital critical edition of this text, which um, I'll be taking you on a little tour through um, in uh, when I finish the formal talk. This manuscript we studied at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, um, MSFR 640, is an anonymous 170 folio French, Middle French manuscript from a, the late 16th century after about 1580 that contains all kinds of notes, instructions, and observations on procedures. It's not straightforward recipes. They're very repetitive, confusing, much is left out. They're often more observations or comments or even notes to um, himself, um, the anonymous author practitioner, as we call um, the person who wrote down this text. Um, so almost a third of this text deals with metal casting, including casting from life, which you see here, and you can see this wonderful lizard um, uh, on the left. It's about three inches um, long. So, um, and then on the in the um, images from the manuscript, you can see this wonderful sketch of how that lizard should be posed on. Um, in a mold and the way in which the channels for the metal should be um, uh, formed in the mold. So it's on this little, it's right there. And then there are many other really wonderful sketches. Um, there are many, many other types of art objects and everyday objects, useful objects um, in the manuscript. And it contains much evidence of firsthand experience and experimenting. And it's really um, quite an unusual source for studying artisanal knowledge. How this manuscript came into being remains a mystery and probably we'll never know, but it's clear that it was composed in um, Toulouse around 1580 and was part of a <clears throat> rich book and manuscript collection belong and art collection belonging to Philippe de Bethune who was an old noble in the service of the kings of France. He was also an art collector, including of such works as this, um, Caravaggio, uh, or work after Caravaggio that was rediscovered in a French church about 20 years ago. It is marked with the Batoon coat of arms. I hope you might, can possibly see that on your little screens. Um, the same as we see on the, um, the manuscript, the cover of the manuscript. Now, all of the um, books and manuscripts from the Batoon collection, before they went, they were made um, as a gift in 1662 to the Royal Library, to the King's Library, and they were all put into a um, cover, into this beautiful cover. So anyway, the, the fact that um, Philippe collected art, was interested in art, is really of a piece with possibly committed this manuscript from a metal worker, possibly buying it from an ambitious artist. We just don't know how it came into being. 
this is an overview of the manuscript's contents, um, categories made by the Making and Knowing or formulated by the Making and Knowing Project. You can see that casting takes up about a third, metal casting takes up about a third of the manuscript, what we have called painting, which has to do with pigments and observations on painting, um, takes up <clears throat> about 14%, and so on. You can see all of the different kinds of um, topics, subjects that are treated in this text. In all, there are 928 separate entries for um, that are blocks of text under headings um, for different kinds of processes or observations of workshops. Now, all of the objects, or many of the objects, not all of them by any means, that these recipes aim to produce or these entries aim to produce in the manuscript would have been at home <clears throat> and collected together in the 16th century in what has been called in the German territories a Kunstkammer or art chamber, a chamber of art, which was a collection of natural and artificial, that is human made things. Um, and here you can see in this depiction of such a, a collection, the shells, then also the human, all of the um, evidence of the artifice of the human hand. So these collections, um, are part of the evidence um, at this time for um, this interest in the power of practical knowledge in the relationship between nature and human art and between the artifice of nature and the artifice of the human hand. I'm going to talk about the content of this practical knowledge in this manuscript, but before I do that, I want to spend just a few minutes describing how the project um, researched the manuscript and produced this edition that we released in 2020. Um, there were four interlocking components of the project. Um, the first one were the text workshops um, in which graduate students in the summer got together and produced the, under the um, guidance of uh, Mark Smith, our paleography lead from the Ecole de Chart in Paris. Um, these students over the course of about four years, we had eight text workshops, um, produced the transcription and translation of the manuscript as they learned skills of paleography, TEI markup, and group translation, which is harder than you can imagine. <clears throat> the paleographers also prepared the manuscript for the um, eight semester long grad um, uh, seminars that we held in the Making and Knowing Laboratory. And these seminars researched and reconstructed the recipes, the entries in the manuscript. And students wrote essays that went on to form the critical apparatus of the edition. Student essays were written in very close dialogue with making and knowing team members and also the expert practitioners whom we invited to the lab um, who were expert in, <clears throat> in um, the, each of the topics that we did during those, um, during those six years, eight years or eight semesters, I guess. Um, so, you know, these people range from conservators to sculptors to silversmiths um, and so on. So they would come for two weeks and they would instruct not just the students, but also the in so-called instructors, um, as we, none of us were experts in any of these techniques. Uh, the third component of the project was an annual working group meeting in which the, re the expert makers, the scholars, the, the many scholars who were who were um, knowledgeable in the area we were studying each year, as well as all of the students from the both semesters of the lab class um, uh, came together in a three or four day meeting. And um, this was a way that the scholars could also exercise critical oversight on the student work. Uh, the fourth component of the was the digital development, um, which uh, we in part prototype we prototyped the edition in part in three digital classes, um, and experimented with the computational markup that our uh, that our digital uh, you know form makes possible, um, and uh, this 
gives you a couple of examples of the kinds of things that um, we could do. I'll also go into that when I show you our sandbox after the lecture. Okay, so with that, keeping in mind those four um, ways in which this um, edition was formed, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the um, insights that we gained from this very intensive work. Insights into the content of practical or craft knowledge, a few of which are um, listed here. I can't obviously go into everything now, a zillion things to say, but um, you can read about these insights in the hundreds of essays in the um, edition. And this shows you, well, I'll show you in a minute, the um, page of essays from the edition. Uh, besides the full French transcription and English translation of this 170 folio manuscript, um, there's also extensive critical commentary written mostly by the students in the lab seminars. And um, so that's where our, the information on the insights that we gained are in the edition. Okay, so now I'm just going to briefly tell you a little bit about those insights. <clears throat> so one of the first, we had many insights about embodied experience in the workshop, um, about the kinds of what we called sensory tools of the workshop. So in our first year in the project, the students repeatedly questioned where the quantities were in the manuscript. You know, where were, how did they know how much to add when they were doing the reconstructions? How much, you know, sand, how much of this, um, this mixture of wine and elm root that you see being poured into the um, molding material. Um, there, there are not many you know, quantitative measurements. Instead, the students came to learn to look for, they learned um, to look for what we called consistency markers. Um, such as the consistency of mustard, which you see in an um, quote from the manuscript, quote, then apply a thick coat as thick as most mustard or a little bit thicker over the metal. Um, and interestingly enough, in a manuscript which only has a few cooking recipes, it has a recipe for mustard. So one of the students tried out the mustard recipe as well. Um, so we really came to realize the centrality of these consistency statements in artisanal knowledge. And this is an example of one which we came to refer to in the lab as the squeeze test, which is, quote, the sand should give a nice hold but still come apart easily, something that, that is repeated several times in the manuscript in relation to molding material. Um, and what we realized was that um, in order to, you know, this is in some ways rather self-evident why these are consistency markers are there um, in the manuscript instead of quantities, but it took actually reconstructing the, the recipes to understand um, why qualities are more important than quantities in the workshop of the 16th century. You have to think materials don't arrive at the workshop in a standardized form. The workshop may well have been open to the weather. And if any of you know, say, the behavior of bread dough in um, wet, humid conditions versus cold, dry conditions, you'll know that this would make a big difference and that you need to add different amounts of things. And so consistency statements are much more useful than quantities. Another thing that we realize is just the constant experimentation. Um, here, the students are reconstructing scores of experiments that the author practitioner undertook in mixing sulfur and wax and pigment to make a better modeling and molding material. So through this constant experimentation, we came to realize, for example, here when you're making um, oyster shells into a very um, fine powder or any of these other experiments, um, reconstructions that the students are doing, that in this constant experimentation with combining and transforming different materials, the author practitioner of this manuscript is constantly investigating the properties of materials and how to transform them from one state to another. Hard, brittle oyster shells, for example, into fine, powdery, as he says, impalpable sand. Throughout the text, the author practitioner is preoccupied with the native 
properties of materials and how to transform them. And you find this focus in many early modern practical writings, which instruct in how to transform materials into a more workable or useful form. A very well-known one is the transformation of brittle iron into malleable steel. This constant material investigation and experimentation into the transformation of materials, which is of course common to any workshop, we came to realize was a way to hypothesize about what materials and processes would work. And through this work, the author practitioner and other writers of practical text really laid out taxonomies of materials and ways of processing them um, in order to do their work. And what those taxonomies do, what that transforming of materials does is to reveal the underlying forms and properties of these materials. Let me just give you an example of this in the opposition of fat and lean that is used constantly in this manuscript. And this is an example of such a systematized taxonomy. Um, it's a system of categories. There's another system of categories used by the author practitioner and also other um, writers on practical knowledge. Um, and that is the Aristotelian categories of cold, hot, wet, and dry. But even more prevalent with regard to metals is the opposition of fat and lean and sour and sweet. And what these do is really form this set of underlying principles, a system of knowledge, if you will, that structured practice. And I think we can call this system, the systemized set of principles or categorized, categories, excuse me, a material imaginary. It's not imaginary, it's not a, mag a work of the imagination, but it is a larger conceptual framework um, that is not a science, but is a material imaginary. In many of the processes such as color making here, and I would argue in art more generally, Raw materials such as these on the, um, on the left, um, these are the raw materials of pigment making. Um, uh, these raw materials are processed and pushed beyond their native properties in order to take on or to imitate the characteristics and appearances of other substances. And let me show you what I mean by that. Here is an example from the manuscript, a well-known um, gold colored pigment in order to being made in order to imitate physical gold. And this in the manuscript is made with turmeric, um, dried turmeric and mixed with various varnishes. It, this was a, um, a, a material that was used by furniture makers to imitate gilding. Um, not always made with turmeric, but other kinds of things. So that's an example of um, really pushing materials beyond their capacity and turning them into something else um, or pushing them beyond their native states. Now there's much imitation in this manuscript. It contains instructions for imitation marble, for imitation glass rouge clair, all substances that can be found on extant objects from this period. Now, this manuscript is partly, it has lots of imitation. It's partly about imitating more expensive materials um, in a cheaper medium, as you see here. Um, but there's another kind of imitation and that is the imitation of optical effects in some of the sleight of hand tricks that are included in this manuscript as they are in other um, works of practice. Um, here it's turning imitation red wine into imitation white wine. Um, and on the right, um, you see the imitation of the particularity of flesh tones that differ by gender and age as the author practitioner notes. So the imitation of optical effects is also important in this manuscript as in other um, art. Uh, uh, works of art. So the, this, this aim of striving to imitate other substances by transforming materials really helps to organize the goals and processes in artisanal work. 
But imitation is also about gaining knowledge of natural processes. The 16th century French potter Bernard Palissy claimed to imitate natural processes that went on in the earth in his making of ceramics, and particularly in his imitation of jasper that you see here in the glazed ceramic spoons on the right. Through such making, he, Palissy, developed theories about the ways that rocks and minerals are formed in the earth, and he um, uh, talked about those theories, his philosophy of labors, as he called it, in his um, texts that he published, and also in what he says were the lectures that he gave to, um, that he opened up to physicians and other interested people in Paris in the 15, um, late 1570s. But you can find these theories in his texts. Now, the manuscript MSFR 640 also contains a recipe for imitation materials. It contains coral and also imitation jasper called in the manuscript um, coral contrefait and jasper contrefait. And of course, counterfeit at this time means a perfect imitation more than it means something that's deceptive. Um, but my point that I'm making here is that the author practitioner is doing the same kinds of things that Pally C is doing, but he is not making the kinds of claims to knowledge. His work is a much more um, investigatory kind of record of his experiments, um, but he's undertaking the same sorts of imitation and gaining knowledge, practical knowledge, that also underlies Pally C's method of um, making knowledge about the natural world. Another connection between imitating and knowledge making is in the manuscript's imitation of living things through techniques such as life casting. The author practitioner was preoccupied in many ways, not just with life casting, with imitating and preserving the lifelikeness of ephemeral living things such as bugs and roses and flower, other flowers and um, even butterflies. Um, by his rather spectacular transformation of materials, both the mold materials and then the metal in the mold, um, the transformation of materials through this process of life casting, which a third of the, almost a third of the manuscript is devoted to. But he was also interested in um, life likeness, preserving life likeness in these processes that preserve the plant or animal itself. And here you see the um, flowers, the, um, the preserved flowers on the right of this um, uh, image are the fresh flowers and, uh, sorry, on the left are the fresh flowers, on the right are the preserved flowers. It's really a remarkable kind of a method of preservation, I think. And then in the um, image of the animals, the cat and the mouse, um, a kind of taxidermy that's, um, recorded in the manuscript. Um, so I noted the interest in this period and the relationship between art and nature, and we can find that also in these taxidermy um, uh, recipes in the manuscript. Um, but in he's not just giving an account of the, this process for taxidermy, but he's also, you can see he adds, um, quote, one can add a painted tongue or horns or wings or anything you may imagine, the same goes for rats or any animal. So he isn't just imitating life and nature in this attempt at life likeness, but he's also playing on how the human hand can alter, transform, maybe even surpass nature. And this was, of course, one aim of the Kunstkammer was to play on these um, connections, to make them clear. Um, and such collections often included these kind of hybrid animals. I want to conclude by talking very briefly about vernacular natural history in the manuscript. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and what I mean by vernacular natural history is all the kind of experiential knowledge that underpinned the work of the so-called wise women, the root cutters, the other kinds of um, individuals who supplied pharmacists and physicians in this period with medicines. They knew what plants were efficacious, where to gather them, and what times of the year, and what ailments they treated. 
Um, and so this kind of knowledge making, this broad collective knowledge making is very important in this kind of work with nature in um, natural so-called natural history at this time. Um, the link between the material world and the textual knowledge of textually trained or university trained physicians was essential in making knowledge about the natural wor world at this time. And we see this kind of vernacular history in vernacular natural history in MSFR 640 as well, including his really remarkable observations on the practices of catching, keeping, feeding, and then killing gently and molding and arranging the animals for life casting. And the manuscript contains all kinds of information about these subjects um, that is not contained in any other text at the time. It's extremely unusual for such vernacular knowledge, which would have been common in the, that period to be codified at this time. So it's really a remarkable text. <clears throat> I wish I had much more time to tell you about our insights, but I um, want to hear your questions. And so I'll just conclude by saying that now the edition is mostly complete. There are a few outstanding essays that scholars need to submit, but um, our next phase is now um, uh, up and ready. Um, we have a research and teaching companion, not quite um, gone live yet to the edition, which makes available lesson plans for hands-on work. Um, that can be downloaded from the site. And we have a sandbox for showcasing how our data can be used for additional information about the text and how it can be visualized, um, as well as a lot of examples of public facing student work. We're also in the midst of applying for grants to develop an open access digital publication tool, Edition Crafter, which is based on the um, software platform for um, Secrets of Craft and Nature, the edition. And this will enable people at relatively, with relative ease to publish their own edition with their own data and it will be low cost and sustainable and open source. Okay, before I finish, I just wanna end by acknowledging core members of the Making Knowing Project, especially the nine postdoctoral scholars with whom I had the great privilege of working as well as core team members, um, our digital lead, Terry Catapano at the um, Bancroft Library in Berkeley, um, Naomi Rosencrantz, who's the assistant director, has been with the project um, for a long time, our paleography lead, Mark Smith, and our project assistant, Carolyn Sermon, <clears throat> and many, many other institutions. And of course, all the students who produced um, all that incredible research and reconstruction. Um, okay, I can stop now and I can either um, give you a quick tour. Let me just give you a very quick tour to the, um, to the project, um, I mean, to the edition here. I hope you can all see the, um, the website of the edition. Um, Zach, can you just, or Eileen, can you just um, confirm that you see that the web page? Uh, yeah, we can see. Okay, it. <laughs> great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, you have the you have several choices up here. I'm just going to do this very quickly. So there will be time for questions. Um, here is the um, the reading page, the reading pane of the manuscript itself. And um, you can move forward simply by putting in the folio name, 3R, for example, whoops, 3R, where I am already. Um, and then you can choose your, you can choose the, um, the other reading panes. Well, you can choose both reading panes, but you have the choice of four versions of the manuscript, the facsimile, the diplomatic or verbatim French um, version, the normalized French, very lightly normalized, just punctuation and some diacritical marks, um, the or the English translation. Um, and you can see that we have um, tried to get the orientation of the um, pages lined up, which took a lot of work, lined up with the um, manuscript itself so that it's easier to navigate um, and to understand what goes um, where. Um, now, you have lots of editorial markings, um, some of them 
informational, such as counterfeit. Um, and some of them that show crossouts, or here we don't have any additions to the page. Um, and then most importantly, you have links to the essays with these little um, beaker icons here. And this takes you out to an essay on counterfeit coral, and you can click on it. You can click out on it um, to um, move to the essay itself. Oops, there we go there. Um, and then you can advance. Now, if you find a questionable term, if you happen to be looking in the French version and you can't figure out what you've never heard a um, term before, sometimes they're explained in all non-French um, terms are explained in little pop-out editorial notes. Um, but we also have a very extensive glossary um, which you can search and find, um, let's see if it has Pix Greek, no, it doesn't, but um, that's explained in the text. Um, okay, so that is the manuscript. You can also um, change, you know, you can look at the diplomatic and the English, for example. Um, you can unlock it so that you can move. You don't have to be on the same page. You can be on page 4R and um, Folio 3V so that you can read it in book mode. You can also read it in book mode by clicking on book mode here and just advance um, through the manuscript as if it were an open book. <clears throat> Okay, then we have lots of um, uh, information on the um, manuscript or on the edition itself on the about page. We have a wonderful video about the possible making of the manuscript and the way that the kind of catalogical information on it. Um, we have principles of translation, transcription, translation, and coding that we used in the um, paleography workshops. Um, we have a page on the digital development if you're interested. All of our um, data is available on the project's GitHub repository. It's all open source and you can use it in whatever way you want. Um, you know, you can see that we have a full um, information about the edition. We have a how to use page. Um, we have different resources. Um, and then we have the research essays. And here you can search for um, essays. It's also, you can simply look at art and its making, knowing nature, et cetera, and then click onto the essay and read it. Um, there's a very robust search search function um, that gives you um, that returns results in the manuscript itself and in the essays. Um, and then I just want to point out one more thing. We um, this is our list of entries, one of our resources. And um, it's not actually showing up exactly. Oh no, I have to close the search. Yeah. Um, Okay, so this is kind of the first easiest approach to the manuscript as data through the entries. That is the 927, 928 um, distinct entries, that is units of text with titles. We group them into these categories in order to navigate the manuscript. Um, so you can click on arms and armor and it will show you all of the um, entries that are about arms and armor. There are 56 of them. Um, or you can look at casting. You can look 357 entries on casting. Now you can also filter the manuscript by tag because of course we marked up everything in this, um, in um, marked up all the um, entries in the manuscript, both with obviously with structural markup, but also with 
semantic markup. And these are our tags. Um, I believe it's uh, 17 or 18 tags um, that we thought could make interesting um, analysis for uh, scholars from art, scholars from history of science. Um, and then of course we have some of the, we have all of the languages if there's a different language used in the manuscript of which there is some Latin, there's some Italian, there's one phrase in Greek, um, there's Poitevin, there's Occitan um, used, and then there's possible two possible German words used in the manuscript about metalworking, which isn't surprising because there were many German metalworkers in Toulouse at this time. Um, you can also, you know, if you want to do body part and measurement, you can put those two in and filter by um, those two. Uh, and then if you can simply click on this and you can see, you can either look in the diplomatic French or the normalized or the translation, and you will see what body parts are mentioned in this um, uh, entry on varnish for panels. Um, you can see the body parts, you can see currency, environment, material, measurement, place, temporal, and tool. So those are all of the um, tags that we use um, and that appear in this entry. Uh, so that's our first um, uh, approach to allowing you to do a little bit of very simple analysis. And um, then we also have this sandbox that in which we've had um, students work on much more complicated analysis um, of digital analysis and computational analysis of the manuscript. And you can see some of their projects here. Um, and then we've also had um, projects, class projects that we are mounting um, on this, this site in before we put up the research and teaching companion site. Um, so there will be another um, semester's uh, projects up here in not very long. We have summer 2021, we have fall 2021 that will be up here soon. And then very usefully, and I hope that all of you will use it if you want to do hands-on work, we have activity sheets, assignments, and um, reconstruction protocols in um, this. We will have many more of them. So for example, we have an activity sheet on growing verdigree, and you can um, download it as a PDF somewhere here. Um, or you can read it off the screen. So you can use these in your classes, probably not making bare degree because it is, it can be toxic, um, but uh, certainly something like bread molding, um, which is a very interesting entry from the manuscript. Um, so let's see, you can download, yes, we have PDF versions of all of them that you can download. Okay, so that tells you about the sandbox where we have our teaching resources at the moment. They will soon be on their own dedicated research and teaching companion. And you have the um, edition itself, which I very much hope that you will um, uh, explore. So with that, I will stop sharing and say, um, I look forward to your questions. Looks like there are already some questions in chat. So. Yes, thank you so much, Pamela. That was fascinating. We do, uh, while people formulate their questions and, and raise their digital hand, I'll just pass on a couple people in the chat wanted to know if there was anything on anatomical casting in the manuscript. And someone else wanted to know if there was any reference to non-European traditions in mm -hmm. any of these recipes. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, anatomical casting. Um, I take it you mean like moulages, whoever answer, asked that question. Um, no, I mean, or maybe you just mean casting of body parts in plaster, perhaps. Um, uh, no, I mean, I mean, that's not true. There is lots of casting of animal body parts, uh, non-human animal body parts. Um, and obviously life casting. In terms of um, 
casting human body parts. Um, there's no reference to it in this manuscript. There is a reference to that it in say Chunino Chunini um, from the beginning of the, uh, from the end of the 14th century. Um, then uh, the next question was what? I've just forgotten, I'm sorry. Whether there's reference to other traditions of making. Oh yes, right, yeah. Oh, so that's really interesting. Um, not on the face of it. I mean, well, okay. I always have to qualify what I say. Um, there are many uh, materials that are being traded globally at this time, which are mentioned in this manuscript, like turmeric, like cochineal, like Brazil wood, um, like uh, lac. Um, so lots of things coming from around the world. Some of them, you know, have been coming to um, crossing Eurasia for centuries. Some of them are newer. Um, the most interesting reference <clears throat> that the author practitioner makes to a to a possibly, I mean, he talks about a a recipe to cure all ailments um, from the Orientals. Now, what does he mean by Orientals? is a question which is asked and um, speculated about in the essay on this. Um, but this practice is to smoke rosemary in a clay pipe. So there's a kind of mixture of traditions at the end of the 16th century coming together, a kind of mixture of global traditions um, coming together, um, you know, for the author practitioner coming from the East. Um, so there's a really interesting kind of witness of um, the, the movement of global materials and practices at this time. Um, then I'm trying to think of, there's another very interesting, the one recipe that ha is, that you could call alchemical in this manuscript is a very, very odd one. It's about, it, it takes something that has, you know, really been present in the alchem in alchemical text since the Middle Ages in Europe, um, which is uh, um, to put kind of low animals into a vessel and um, by feeding them certain strange materials, you will eventually get a poison or a cure-all. And um, in Instead, it takes, it talks about um, putting silkworms, doing this with silkworms, which I have never seen a recipe in the European tradition of using silkworms to create what he says, a gold powder. Now there is, a, there are other texts that talk about, um, you know, putting lizards and salamanders into a vessel and um, making a powder that will turn things, um, that will make things at least seem like gold, maybe even make gold, um, but never with silkworms, which is very interesting because silkworms are the kind of um, essential, quintessential transformative animal in China, in, chi in the Chinese tradition of alchemy and of other kinds of transformation. So clear, I think, because it's so unusual, and here we are, you know, in um, in southern France, um, it's possible that this is an evidence of a practice of a text coming, you know, from China, probably through the Islamic world, North Africa. Oh, the other reason that this is there's a clue to this. I should have mentioned this is the recipe is called or the entry is called um, the work of Algiers. Um, so, you know, just incredibly interesting connections. And you can read about that in the essay on it. And Nick Herman has a question. Uh, thank you so much for this oh, wonderful talk. I've been following this, this amazing project for a while and, and um, find it totally fascinating. Um, my question is sort of about what you think might be the intended sort of the kind of scope of the audience for uh, you know MS Francais 640 and and also the kind of the kind of communities of practice it might have been anchored in I mean it, it strikes me I mean it's 
it's still a fairly formally composed manuscript, you know, that was probably probably had some kind of draft or series of notes, maybe that were mm -hmm. then, you know, formally transformed into this, these 900 entries. And I, I wonder also about sort of the language and what, I mean, I, I'm more familiar with sort of um, um, manuals uh, and recipe books for manuscript illumination and kind of visual arts mm -hmm. uh, and that often evince a kind of sense of secrecy that these mm -hmm. are recipes that should be kept hidden who you know to within a workshop within a uh, sort of patrilineal sort of you know um, workshop or you know I think of other art forms like Limoges enamel and saint porcher mm -hmm. also in southwestern mm -hmm. France where there's kind of yeah. guardedness about yeah. recipes. This is valuable knowledge, right? So mm -hmm. I, I wonder, do you see, do you, is your, is your sense, I mean, what is your sense about the sort of authorial voice? I mean, yeah, is there kind of a... very interesting. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question, a really central question. So this manuscript is, I'll just talk a little bit about it's in this hand that you saw, um, it's it's almost exclusively in that hand. There are a few other hands in the manuscript. Clearly one of them is a scribe because it leaves out some um, words and in one case is even filled in by the dominant hand. Um, the, the script is, you know, not a scribe's hand. It's a, but it's a very competent hand, obviously. Um, and, you know, the question for us from the beginning was, is this a practitioner? Is this someone else, merchant, you know? Um, but the expertise in the casting, in the metal workings is so extensive that it seems like it must, and, and the firsthand evidence in those, um, in those entries is so great that it seems like it must be a um, metal worker at the same time and you know we had um, a couple of postdocs who did really extensive work in the Toulouse archives and they found you know other examples of um, of uh, founders metal founders and goldsmiths who have a profile it's not this person I mean at least from the manuscript I mean from the handwriting perspective um, but but have a profile that's not so far from this one. So an entrepreneurial founder who became, you know, served um, in the military, was trying to sell weapons. Um, and, you know, there's a lot on weapons in this manuscript. Um, there was a goldsmith who's making, even though the goldsmiths, um, uh, uh, guild in Toulouse is forbidden from making imitation stones. There are a lot of um, recipes for imitation stones in this manuscript. Um, there is evidence of a, you know, master of the guild being commissioned to make a um, uh, imitation sapphire actually commissioned by a niece of the Batoons, of Philippe de Batoon. So that's, you know, really an interesting and close connection, um, but uh, is not this, or at least as far as we can tell, is not this person. So, so it seems like he was probably someone like that, um, you know, entrepreneurial, uh, um, interested. Now, there is one folio or two folios, 162R and 166V, um, which do kind of give the sense that maybe he was had an idea of publishing this as a text. Um, and he even says this wonderful um, sentence in which he says that I am putting out, I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't quote it. I, I, I can't quote it um, verbatim. But anyway, he is putting out his wares in order to get in return valuable processes. And so, um, so this, so it seems like, you know, he's putting out his wares in public in order to gain, you know, knowledge in, in the way that, um, you know, other artisans did in terms of like spreading their ideas, other metal workers, for example, not spreading their ideas, but advertising their capacities and, and um, you know, making known their, 
their knowledge. Um, it's true that this knowledge is often, there's a rhetoric of secrecy, um, not in this manuscript, although he does say a couple times, this is my secret, but what he really means by that, like Alessio Piemontese meant by it is, these are, my tr these are my techniques. These are my kind of tricks of the trade, right? Not deceptive tricks, but techniques of the trade. Um, another thing about the text is it's a clean text. It's not like he had it beside him in the workshop, right? <laughs> Obviously. So he must have had another space where he went and wrote down. And, you know, it's clear that, you know, it's so disorganized in many ways. There's so much additional marginalia added, you know, saying, try it this way, try it that way, um, that this seems to be kind of a version of notes, really, I think, more than anything else. Now, it's clear also, it's not all his work. I mean, he's observing glassworking um, workshops, for example, and, and he's clear that it's, you know, he's not doing it. He's saying they do it this way in glassworking um, workshops. So, so, you know, he is not just talking about his own work, but he's thinking about um, trades and uh, in general. I'll say one more thing, which is that Philippe de Bethune published a text on ruling, on governing. And in it, he says, and artisans are valuable because, um, because they form the material productivity of a, of a realm. Um, so, you know, there's a connection there. Uh, besides the art connection, there's a connection to a the the same kind of valorization of um, craft that, say, um, Amon and Sachs did in the Stendebuch. Thank you. That's that's wonderful. And, and so, just a, a final point that so the the fact that it's kind of that it's annotated then would sort of suggest that it's a. I mean, there is some, you know, kind of use value. I mean, it's not just a presentation. It's not just something to impress. A patron like Betune, I mean, it's with potential. Yeah, I, I think it's not because there are no claims to, you know, special knowledge or, I mean, it's just a very, I mean, you can say it's a very modest document in that way as compared to somebody like Bernard Palissy. Or Leonardo or something, who's, you know, yeah. talking about all the things you could do. Yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sarah Simon, go ahead. I, this was really so fascinating, and I know nothing about the subjects, but but I was particularly interested when you talked about how the students had problems, or not problems, but were challenged by measurement versus consistency. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I have some small experience with South Asia and they are now recreating or trying to restore various things using traditional um, methods of doing it. So again, that was where my question came as far as was there any, probably not, but was there any reference to um, other traditions, whether they measured with consistency or measurements? Mm -hmm. um, well, I can speak to European books of craft or, you know, books of practical knowledge, and um, they use by and large consistency for the reasons I, I, I mentioned right. that, you know, it wouldn't be useful to use quantities in many cases. The only um, qualification to that is that assayers texts, so those people who um, determine the purity of metal often use um, quantities and presumably that's because it is a trade that is, has been codified legally for a long time or its practices are codified mm. legally. And so um, there's would be, you know, a need for standardization there. So, and, and this manuscript actually in the um, 
in the entries that deal with some metal processes that would have been part of an assayer's trade does use quantities, ounces huh. and huh. drams. Um, so that's, that's um, one kind of um, difference from the consistency of things like mold materials. Um, I was gonna say something else about your question. But you, you don't, I mean, the folks working on this did not uh, look to other traditions as far as how did they measure the oyster shells in order, or not measure, but how did they uh, use the oyster shells? Was it through consistency or was it through measurement? Um, I can't speak to other traditions outside of Europe, um, you know, based on textual textual um, sources. I'll just say that mm. with your question about oyster shells, so the effort, like in many other of those processes of transformation, in order to make mold materials, um, the transformation is into a a very fine powder, which is called right. impalpable. And it's called impalpable in French, in Italian, in English at this time. And it's really a, you know, pan-European technical term for, huh. you know, what you're supposed to come up with for mold material, um, because that will make, you know, give you fine detail right. in the mold. Um, so, so even without, measurements there is a very you know there is a language and a standard of precision um and that is impalpable you and in fact the author practitioner even defines it in some places that's one of our tags is author practitioner definitions because he says things like impalpable you it you can't you can't feel it when you hold it between your fingers huh, huh, huh. so um yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I mean, it opens a whole other from from a non-Western point of view. What you're doing here opens all sorts of avenues um, from that point of view to look at the things that the texts, etc., uh, that were used. Um, this is fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, a couple of very quick questions in the chat. Um, one was one of the one of the tags was one of the topics covered. Uh, Megan Brown and I also noticed this one was La Boutique, and um, mm -hmm. what is yeah. what is that? And Lynn Farrington uh, wanted to know how you decided on this particular manuscript, given how yeah. much resources you expended on it. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so in terms of La Boutique, that's very important. Those are those two entries, if you search for La Boutique, um, which means the workshop. I mean, it simply means the workshop at this time. You know, some craftspeople sold their work from the workshop, but La Boutique is common in French um, texts at this time, meaning simply the workshop. And that is, in fact, what he calls these two entries um, in which he mentions, you know, I'm spreading my wares in order to get a promise of return of better things or of other processes. Um, and that's, and, you know, Mark Smith, my collaborator um, from the Ecole de Chartres, really believes that that's the key to the whole text. That is, he was going to publish a, you know, the plan was to publish a how-to book called La Boutique. Um, I, I, I'm not convinced by that. I think it's compelling, but I'm not entirely convinced. I think that he was also just commenting on the workshop in those entries, although those two entries are very different than the rest of the text in terms of just how much they um, seem to be self-reflective um, on what he's doing rather than simply practical, incredible detailed practical knowledge. And the choice of this manuscript. Oh yeah, the like choice of this manuscript. Out. Oh, uh, who can even remember that long ago? <laughs> um, well, so I was interested in when I was researching um, the body of the artisan way back in the two thousands. Um, I was very interested in life casting, and uh, 
this manuscript was actually, I didn't, I mean, I'm not, don't claim to discover it by any means. Um, um, Leonard Amico, who works on Palissy or who worked on Palissy and wrote a wonderful book on Palissy, um, knew about this manuscript and um, he published a couple of sketches from it. And um, that's where I first saw it. Um, so I knew that I needed to look at it. And so I started reading it at that time. But, you know, I had no idea what I was reading because so much of it is so technical. And so then I began working with a silversmith uh, interested in historical techniques and we began reconstructing the life casting. Um, oh, a long time ago, 2007. And, you know, then I realized what an incredible teaching text it could be and also how it really called out for a um edition because you know it's very hard to understand without reconstructing without really doing a lot of both textual and um, hands-on work on the manuscript and so on the entries rather and so i realized you know why not work in the way that a scientific research group works you know postdocs graduate students. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, you know, be able to get a lab at an old 1940s unreconstructed lab at Columbia, and then um, these NSF and NEH grants, um, which have been really fundamental to doing the whole thing. John, go ahead. It's it's wonderful and incredible. Thank you so much. I mean, there's, there's some uh, comments in the chat that you can read later about what a great model of a project this is. And certainly, as you were just saying, in terms of, you know, the sort of modeling a different kind of team-based approach and, and humanities and digital humanities approach is certainly a lot that we all have to learn. So, uh, and long-term planning as well. Um, thank you for all that. Um, I, I think uh, just quickly, uh, I think Megan's joke might've been, you know, la boutique could also be the shop. So. The shop where you buy t-shirts and things so i hope you i hope you are producing the backpacks and t-shirts and everything else that um, people can buy at la boutique but um more seriously i just wanted to uh say thanks and throw a couple of big things out there that you could Great. talk about if you want um okay. one of them that is interesting to me and you mentioned it once or twice is alchemy um or the lack of it and I, 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 you know, it's not a subject I have any, I'm just passing interest in. We have a lot of alchemical materials and stuff in this collection too. And it's just interesting. I mean, would you characterize this as an anti-alchemical work? It's so interested in transformation and yet it seems to touch not at all on the, I mean, I don't know. Is there something to yeah. say about the place of alchemy in, in the intellectual space world of this manuscript? Or maybe that's a story that we tell too much about to the neglect of the kind of materials you're bringing to our attention. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. And the other big thing, if you want, I'm just mm -hmm. fascinated by uh, your your coinage author practi practitioner as a, you know, clearly you've thought a lot about this. You're, you all have. And this notion of uh, almost suggesting that as historians of the written of written culture we need we need a new category we need another category of early modern authorship in some ways and so all these are great things so thank you so much well thank you so much for those great questions and um yes we always thought the burn salve we should sell in la boutique but we just haven't had time to uh set up the whole you know online ordering form um anyway uh alchemical great question so this text is completely alchemical in the sense of alchemy at the time. I mean, alchemy at the time was the science of transformation and it was practiced in workshops. It was, I mean, a, a practitioner might not call themselves an alchemist, might not, might in fact absolutely bridle it being called an alchemist because of course there was also a discourse of alchemy being deceptive, you know, being both, extremely important esoteric divine knowledge but also on you know on the other end of the spectrum um uh, completely deceptive um but most people even those who were really anti-alchemy were 
um, believe that useful things had come from the pursuit, right? Um, so, you know, looking at it in hindsight, we can say that, you know, alchemy is all about transformation, that this is a science that was at the heart of, you know, thinking about nature at this time. And um, that uh, the, the, you know, the transforming of materials was also something that happened in artisans workshops. And alchemists often said um, something like this, that alchemy is the epitome of all art, that is the work of the human hand. So that they were complete, you know, they were overlapping in so many different ways. Um, and uh, so, you know, this, does this author practitioner ever mention the word alchemy? No. Um, is that recipe, that entry for the work of Algiers an alchemical entry? Yes. I mean, it's making a gold powder at the end um, out of silkworms. Uh, so, so, you know, it's all part of the same work. And, um, the other thing to say about alchemy at this time is that unlike most other textual pursuits, and this was, had been true back into the middle ages, it was a learned discipline that had a handwork component. And, you know, it wasn't taught in universities, although during the, you know, wars of reform during the Reformation, it actually, it was one of the first hands-on pursuits to be taught um, in Hesse in the, in the 17th century. So, I mean, that's, it's very telling that, um, you know, this is the, um, this is the, realm of knowledge that artisans could be, relate to, could even use the language of when they began to write texts. And they often did that. Um, your second question, I'm so sorry. Uh, author practitioner. <laughs> oh, yeah, author practitioner. Um, yeah, well, we were, you know, he's not an author exactly, and he's not a pr practitioner only, and we had to have some way to refer to this anonymous writer of this text. Sometimes we thought author, practitioner, compiler, you know, he also compiled. Um, in many ways, I would say that um, this is the way to refer, this is a useful way to refer to a lot of different um, to a lot of texts of practice, the how-to texts that um, I started off talking about. You know, and then there are the printers. I think the printers are just so interesting. I mean, the printer, compiler, practitioner, authors. Um, and, you know, we just have to expand our notion of authorship, basically. And, and also expand our notion of how you read a text. I mean, you can't read these texts um, simply by, you know, paging through them because you won't get anywhere with them. They are just so, um, you know, what do you remember? What do you pay attention to? Um, and uh, so that's why, you know, doing the processes in the laboratory, having the students reconstruct them really became a form of interpretation of close reading. You know, it is a form of interpretation, but it's much more appropriate to these kinds of material and practical texts. Because of course, their, the, their contents are, can never be complete unless they are, you know, made into an effect. I mean, unless they are effected and they're different from, you know, texts that don't necessarily have to do with practice at this time. Now, presumably there are many other texts like this, like maybe theater, works of theater, et cetera. But, but um, certainly with these kind of how-to texts, I really think that they need this additional dimension of practice to be really appreciated um, and interpreted. Well, I, I'm definitely going to try to turn the red wine into white wine. That that that's sounds like a, a great party trick. That's an easy one. You just need to find Brazil wood. 
um, which is an endangered uh, <laughs> yeah, where'd you get the result? now. But you can use logwood. That's very much available in Kramer pigments, uh, historical pigments um, cellar in New York City and in Germany. Do you do you survive if you drink the wine afterwards? Oh yes, or? the author yeah. practitioner even says, and you can drink it and not get sick. <laughs> Well, we cannot try that in the lab, but <laughs> um, I think we should uh, let you go after a really inspiring opening to the semester. What a great way to start the the project is amazing, both substantively and uh, like in what we learned about the manuscript, but also clearly you can see in the chat a uh, very inspiring in the process and method and um, the, the kinds of collaboration that you use to do it. So I think a lot of us are like brainstorming. What can we, what can we apply to get a grant to do with a collaborative uh, lab like this with students and, and colleagues? It's it's really cool. Um, so join me in um, in thanking Pamela Smith. Um, next week we'll be back on Zoom um, for um, for uh, at our regular time um, for Carlos Spurhaza, um talking about uh, Goethe's. Failed, failed formats, Goethe's literary anthology for the German people. Um, so we'll be we'll be hearing about uh, a different kind of authorship compiling and anthologizing um, next week. Hope to see you all then uh, and each coming week. Thanks thank again. you. I'll just say thank you to everybody for their great questions and thank you all for your organization and for inviting me. And please do use those um, class activities. You can use them. You don't need a lab. And if you do, let us know how it goes. So thank you all so much.